Hi, this is Dr. Mark Miravalli, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I'm happy to be with you today speaking to you about the Mother of Jesus. Now, in previous programs, we've talked about Our Lady's role as co-redemptrix. And for those who are not Catholic, when we, when we use the expression Our Lady, we're talking about uh, an honorary title in relationship to Jesus Christ. In fact, the, the Latin word domina is the female version of dominus. And we know even in the medieval days, you would have the lord of the castle and the lady of the castle. Uh, but it was very clear who had the primacy. The Lord was the Lord. And in the Christian understanding and in the Catholic understanding, the Lord is the Lord. There's only one Savior. There's only one God-man, and that's Jesus Christ. But Mary is called Our Lady because she has a special relationship, a unique, privileged relationship with the Lord. She is mother of the Lord, and she is queen in the kingdom of God. So, when Catholics use the expression Our Lady, it is always a, a, a title of love and of honor, but it never places Mary above Jesus. It's always in relationship to her divine Son. Now, the Church calls Mary the co-redemptrix, and in a recent program we talked about a, a quote from John Paul II, where John Paul said that because she was spiritually crucified with her crucified Son at Calvary, that she is rightly called the co-redemptrix, but that her role as co-redemptrix does not cease at the glorification of her son. That means it doesn't stop at Calvary. What do we understand by this? Well, we understand a couple things. First of all, that Mary's suffering continues uh, in a mysterious way, and we see, we hear reports of uh, weeping statues. Many of our uh, Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters have weeping icons of Our Lady. Uh, there are approved Marian apparitions like at Akita in Japan where Our Lady wept 101 times uh, in light of the ongoing sin and rejection of her son at this time. So she continues as co-redemptrix, but there's yet another meaning of what John Paul II meant when he said that her role as co-redemptrix doesn't cease with the glorification of her son. And essentially it means that now that Jesus has redeemed the world along with Mary and subordinated to Jesus always. We now have this infinite storehouse of graces, but there's still a critical task to be done. We have to get the graces that Jesus merits superabundantly on the cross to human hearts. To have an overflowing stream of graces is not gonna save people in itself. It has to be received. It has to be accepted. It has to be freely accepted by human hearts. That is also the role of the mother of Jesus. That because she uniquely participated with Jesus in the, in the accomplishment of redemption, what we call the acquisition of the graces of redemption, isn't it appropriate that God the Father would then give to her the corresponding role of distributing the graces of redemption? First, they're acquired by Jesus, the new Adam, and by Mary, the new Eve, but then they must be distributed. They must be dispensed to human hearts. That is precisely why the church calls Mary the Mediatrix of all graces. And once again, let's make clear, the title Mediatrix does not put Mary on a level of equality with Jesus Christ, the Mediator. Quite the contrary. It is because Jesus is the one Mediator between God and man that Mary has the possibility of sharing in that mediation. So let's go to the most quoted scripture passage whenever you hear words like mediator or mediatrix, either, either pro or con. And that would be 1 Timothy 2.5. In 1 Timothy 2.5, for those who accept sacred scripture, St. Paul says there is one man that in fact has the role of mediation between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Now, of course, we know he's a God-man. And this God-man, as St. Paul says, is the one mediator between God and man. Now, what does St. Paul mean when he says one mediator? Well, he can mean one of two things. And there's two words in the Greek as well. 
he can mean one as exclusive, that the only mediator between God and man is Jesus, and no one else can even share in that. No one can have anything to do with it. Or, secondly, he can mean one primary mediator, that Jesus Christ is the critical, crucial, all-essential mediator between God and man, but because of Jesus' generosity, because of the perfection of his mediation, others are called to share in that mediation. And let's drop out of high theology for a second. Let's get more specific and personal. Did you pray for anybody today? Anybody at all? Did you pray for your mom or dad? Did you pray for your kids? If you did, you shared in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. It's plain and simple. You did not sidestep Jesus Christ and go right to the Father in terms of any powerful efficacious, efficacious mediation um, in any Christian context. Even if you went directly to the Father in your prayer, you still got all your merits through Jesus Christ. So you were a mediator that shared in the one mediation of Jesus Christ today. That tells us that so can others. And it tells us that Mary who was the woman who most perfectly conformed to the will of God and who most perfectly participated in the acquisition of the grace of redemption is also the person who shares in the mediation of Jesus Christ more than any other human being. And in our next program, we're going to talk about Old Testament and New Testament examples of human or created mediators so that we're sure that these do not compete with Jesus Christ. It gives him more glory the more of us that share in dispensing the mysteries of salvation to humanity. Thanks. God bless you. Mm-hmm.